Diverticular disease of the colon is one of the most common complaints related to colon pathology. Its wide array of clinical presentation characteristics can make the diagnosis difficult, especially in the elderly patient who has no known history of colon pathology or who may have never had a screening colonoscopic exam, such of course as a colonoscopy. As such, diverticular disease can present with pain and tenderness, bleeding, perforation, hyperactive bowel sounds, fever, nausea, vomiting, and many other complaints that could confuse the diagnosis as Crohn's disease, especially Crohn's colitis, or even ulcerative colitis, or even colon cancer. Welcome to this presentation on diverticular disease of the colon. We'll talk about this disease, what we think causes it, how the patient presents, how it's treated, and the complications that can ensue as a result of untreated or chronic symptomatic diverticular disease. This presentation is only a preview of diverticular disease and is not meant to discuss all of the surgical or diagnostic options. Surgical treatments will be discussed in your third year core surgical rotations. Radiographic examinations will be discussed in your radiology presentations. Many patient presentations for diverticular symptoms will be seen and often managed by the family physician. The complications are usually treated by a general surgeon or a gastroenterologist. Two chapters which are highly recommended for your perusal include Diagnosis and Management of Acute Diverticulitis and Lower GI Bleeding. While not required reading, all these chapters are provided to you. The student with an interest in performing well on their examinations and preparing for their clinical surgical rotations will peruse all of these chapters carefully. The other chapters are provided for reference. This disease will be seen and managed by surgeons, internists, family physicians, infectious disease specialists, and gastroenterologists. This is not a rare disease. You will encounter it commonly. These chapters will be provided to you as PDFs so that you can have them for your reading pleasure. By the way, you did know that perusal means to read carefully, right? Here are some terms introduced in this presentation. They're listed in alphabetical order. Never mind that I missed number 27 there. Anyways, please don't memorize these terms. They're here to help form an index of the terminology that this presentation introduces to you or in some cases reviews for you. Remember learning objectives are provided for the use and guidance of the instructor to ensure all the salient points have been covered. Please do not limit yourself to just the learning objectives listed here. Look at the objectives on the required readings too. The first learning objective is number one describe diverticuli in general including the types location and causes. Next, we'll discuss number two, the specific risk factors, anatomical defects, and the locations of various types of diverticular disease, as not all diverticular disease is found in just the colon. Then, I'll expect you to number three, list and describe the five most common complications, including their clinical presentations. Then, we'll move on so you can learn to number four, Recommend the best diagnostic studies used in evaluating diverticular pathology. Further, it'll be important for you to recommend the best treatment for specific diverticular disease. And then finally, number six, what is a fistula? Describe the types of fistula most commonly seen in diverticular disease and how they're treated. Diverticular disease can be difficult and frustrating to treat, both for the physician and the patient. Some of the treatments are operative. You aren't expected to learn all these different operative procedures yet, but a glancing understanding is needed. Here, the word mass refers to an abdominal mass. A patient suffering from a diverticular disease can present with abdominal distension. The cause, besides the inflammatory response of acute diverticulitis, which can cause a significant amount of abdominal pain. The pain and distension can also cause an ileus. Think of an ileus as sick intestines that won't percolate or peristalse their contents. 
Instead, the intestines just lie there, becoming distended, and in turn, this distension causes pain. Another reason for abdominal distension can be a diverticular stricture. We'll talk about this later and look at some images of diverticular strictures. If the colon has become narrowed, that's known as a stricture, then the feces can't pass through the narrowing in the colon, eventually causing a bowel obstruction proximal to the narrowed segment, aka above the stricture. Diverticular disease can also cause massive lower GI bleeding. As a general rule, diverticulosis bleeds while diverticulitis does not. Bleeding diverticuli from any portion of the intestine, i.e. the small bowel or the colon, can bleed massively. In the same manner, diverticuli of the small bowel can also become inflamed, a condition called jejunal diverticulitis. There is jejunal diverticulitis, ileal diverticulitis, Meckel's diverticulitis, cecal diverticulitis, and sigmoid diverticulitis. Remember though, it is the non-inflamed diverticuli that usually bleed. Hence the reason this GI bleeding flowchart is included in this talk. So what are diverticuli? Diverticuli are outpouchings or protrusions of a portion of the bowel wall through the muscularis, either false or a pseudodiverticulum. Diverticuli can be classified as either true if the diverticulum includes all layers of the bowel wall or false diverticuli and then further subdivided into a pulsion or traction diverticuli depending on their cause. Perhaps most important, they can occur anywhere in the GI tract. The esophagus, i.e. a Zenker's diverticulum, which is a false diverticulum, a jejunal diverticulum, which can be either true or false, or an ileal or even a cecal diverticulum. The photos here show an esophageal diverticulum, a Zenker's diverticulum. This is a false diverticulum since it only contains mucosa and not all the layers of the esophagus. Jejunal diverticuli and other small bowel diverticuli can be either false or true. If the diverticulum is of congenital origin, it most likely is a true diverticulum containing all the layers of the wall of the intestine. False diverticuli do not contain all of the layers of the intestinal wall. Here's an image of colonic diverticuli. The yellow arrow clearly shows the diverticuli on the colon segment. This segment of colon has experienced some elements of narrowing. Chronic diverticulosis can result in a stricture of the colon and subsequently cause a bowel obstruction. Please click on the link provided to view the abstract of the paper, The Pathology of Diverticular Disease, which is also provided to you as a PDF. Quite frankly, even though we often discuss the cause of diverticulosis of the colon as due to the consumption of a low fiber diet, the truth is, we are not completely sure why patients get this disease. There could be an undiscovered hereditary component too. Alcohol consumption also seems to play a role. Because the most common diverticuli occur in the sigmoid colon, we'll spend most of this presentation discussing colonic diverticuli. Here are some questions we've answered already. What are they? Well, they're outpouchings of colon mucosa. They can be either true or false diverticuli, they're most commonly found in the sigmoid colon. What is their cause? In short, we're not 100% sure of what the cause is. Most believe it's from increased pressure within the colon. However, this would not explain jejunal or cecal diverticuli where the peristaltic pressure is not as intense as it is in the sigmoid colon. How common are they? Diverticuli of the colon are very common. They are found usually between the age groups of 40 and 80 years of age, and 80% of adults over 80 will have some diverticulosis. However, most will be asymptomatic. How are they diagnosed? They can be diagnosed in a number of ways. Colonoscopy examinations, barium enema examinations, CAT scanning, or physical exam where sometimes they're palpable as a firm hard mass in the left lower quadrant. If they're bleeding, colonoscopy and or a bleeding scan, a tagged red cell scan, will be most useful. Other symptoms? Most patients with symptomatic diverticular disease, 
will complain of a dull ache or a sharp pain in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. The pain can be of an acute onset and associated with a low-grade fever, nausea, vomiting, and changes in bowel habits with narrowing of the stool, pencil-thin stools. We'll talk about the common complications and how we treat diverticular disease in the upcoming slides. We believe the cause of colonic diverticuli is a result of increased pressure within the lumen of the colon, which in turn causes a herniation of the mucosa and submucosal layers of the bowel wall through the weakest points between the longitudinal tinea coli muscle bands and between the circular muscle rings where the blood vessels penetrate the colon wall. If you look at the image provided, you can see the diverticuli usually occur between the tinea where the blood vessel penetrates the mucosa and submucosa, leaving a weak spot. Association with a low fiber, i.e. a refined Western diet, which some believe cause constipation, spasm, and an increased intraluminal pressure, especially in the sigmoid colon, is often attributed as the cause for diverticular disease. An elevation in elastin has also been attributed to the cause. According to the required reading, quote, a diet containing refined carbohydrates and low fiber suggests such as is currently widespread in many developed countries, especially the West, has been associated with an elevated elastin levels which are commonly noted at colon wall sites containing diverticuli, and this change causes shortening of the tinea. So exactly what are diverticuli? We learned in the previous slide their herniations of the mucosa and submucosa through the muscle layers of the colonic wall. In fact, we can see they clearly occur adjacent to the tinea and most commonly between the anti-mesenteric tinea. In fact, our reference states Diverticuli are small outpouchings of the colon that occur in rows at sites of vascular penetration between the single mesenteric tinea and one of the anti-mesenteric tinea. At the sites of most diverticuli, the muscle layers are absent. Technically, such lesions are really pseudo-diverticuli. It is interesting that this paper cites they occur between the single mesenteric tinea and one of the anti-mesenteric tinea. Thus, colonic diverticulosis represents pseudo or false diverticuli, since the diverticulum does not contain all of the layers of the bowel wall. In fact, here we clearly see the circle where the blood vessel penetrates all of the bowel wall layers. Yet, a diverticulum has not occurred at these weak points. If we look at the anti-mesenteric tinea, we'll note in this photo a diverticulum has occurred between the mesenteric tinea, but not through both anti-mesenteric tinea areas. We still do not know the exact causes of these colonic diverticuli, and these findings are likely of little clinical significance. Remember, however, the sigmoid colon does have its own mesentery and is considered an intraperitoneal portion of the colon. Does this help explain the cause of or the location of diverticular disease of the sigmoid colon. Interestingly, a paper entitled Diverticular Disease, Evolving Concepts of Classification, Presentation and Management, goes on to cite there is evidence highly suggesting a high fiber diet, which is often our treatment for patients with diverticular disease and the associated frequent bowel movements were associated with a greater and not a lower prevalence of diverticular disease. Obvious, it is clear that we do not know the exact cause of diverticular disease. Should we be recommending a high fiber diet? Should we be recommending alcohol abstinence? Should we routinely study each colon resection segment for an elevated elastin content? I strongly suggest you click on the Adobe Acrobat icon and read the source paper. I'm pleased to see a paper suggesting alcohol consumption as a risk factor for the development of diverticular disease. In my clinical practice, it appeared most, but not all, of my patients who presented with symptomatic diverticular disease of the colon, perforation or diverticulitis, were consummate users of alcoholic beverages. Interestingly, this article points out the overall prevalence of diverticulosis was 32.8% in the subject studied. This study also found diet, 
body mass index, i.e. obesity, lack of physical activity, and bowel habits were not associated with the disease, despite the common teaching that in obese individuals who consume a refined diet are at risk for diverticular disease. Interestingly, this paper found increasing prevalence of diverticulosis with higher alcohol consumption, thus making a strong correlation with national per capita alcohol consumption rates. Their final conclusion was alcohol use is a significant risk factor for the development of colonic diverticulosis. And this relationship may offer a partial explanation for the existing east-west paradox in disease prevalence and phenotype. Here's what diverticulosis looks like through an endoscope during a colonoscopy. I've labeled the lumen and used arrows to show the protrusions or the outpouchings and how they appear from within the colon. I've also circled a small polyp if you'd like to see what a small benign polyp looks like. Please click on the video to watch a one and a half minute video showing colonic diverticulosis. Remember, the tinea of the colon only go as far as the pelvic peritoneal reflection and diverticulosis will not occur in the rectum or below the peritoneal reflection deep in the pelvis. Pull out your anatomy book to review this. Colonic diverticulosis is limited to that portion of the colon above the peritoneal reflection, i.e. more proximal colon than the rectum. Does this suggest to us anything about the cause of colonic diverticulosis? Diverticuli can be found throughout the entire GI tract. In the colon, they are most likely seen in the sigmoid colon. Colonic diverticuli of the ascending colon is seen in only about 15% of people. In this image, we see an inflamed cecal diverticuli. Acute cecal diverticulitis can be easily confused with acute appendicitis, especially if the cecal diverticulum is small. If the surgeon encountered this patient, he most likely would perform a resection of the cecum, removing the appendix at the same time, and perform a primary anastomosis, meaning he'd hook the bowel back up. This image shows a fecal lith. The cecum can clearly be identified as being full of oral contrast. That's why it's white in color. Initially, this patient would be treated with antibiotics, and if there was no clinical improvement, resection of the cecum would be required with removal of the appendix too. Diverticular disease can cause massive lower GI bleeding. Inflamed diverticuli, i.e. acute diverticulitis, rarely if ever bleeds. However, diverticulitis, acute inflammatory diverticulitis, can present with fever, an elevated white blood cell count, localized lower abdominal pain, usually in the left lower quadrant, constitutional GI symptoms of diarrhea, constipation, even obstruction. If a fistula is present, the patient can have air in their urine, called pneumaturia, or feces appear in the urine, fecal urea, and even simply have symptoms of urgency and frequent urination or recurrent urinary tract infections if the involved colon segment abuts the urinary bladder. That's demonstrated in the upper image. Many times, left-sided sigmoid diverticulitis is referred to as left-sided appendicitis, and many a surgeon has been fooled into thinking their patient has appendicitis when they actually have diverticulitis, and of course, vice versa. Thus, here again, we see an image showing us the common complications of diverticular disease. Number one, abscess or infection. Number two, stricture formation as a result of long-term chronic inflammation. Number three, perforation of the diverticulum, either into the mesentery where it's contained or free into the peritoneal cavity where it can cause peritonitis and sepsis. Number four, bleeding from non-inflamed diverticuli, which is relatively common in the elderly patient. And of course, number five is fistula formation between the colon and adjacent organs like the urinary bladder. So again, you should memorize these five most common complications as you will encounter them multiple times in your career. Bleeding from diverticulosis can be massive, and as a general rule, diverticulitis does not cause bleeding. 50% of diverticular bleeding can actually occur from diverticuli present in the right colon. 
abscess formation is common and rupture of the abscess may cause a perforation. Subsequently, sepsis can also occur. As the inflammation occurs repetitively, hypertrophy of the muscle layers can cause narrowing of the colon and form a stricture leading to a colonic obstruction. Fistula can also form. The most common fistula is an abnormal communication between the colon and the bladder called a colovesical fistula. But a fistula can occur between the colon and the uterus or the colon and the colon eroding into another segment of colon or even into a segment of small bowel called a coloenteric fistula. A coloenteric fistula can cause hyperactive bowel sounds, very loud borborygmy, bloating, pain, and obstruction. You should memorize these, just like this, in a list. Here are some images taken from my own personal medical practice files. These are images of an 80-year-old veteran who presented with a palpable mass in the left lower quadrant. He had tenderness, a low-grade fever, an elevated white count, and was a lifelong user of alcoholic beverages. CT scanning was inconclusive for cancer or diverticulitis as the patient had never had a previous colonoscopy. The CT scan only showed inflammation in the sigmoid. The radiologist felt cancer was a possibility. Colonoscopy was performed on this patient showing pus within multiple diverticuli consistent with a diagnosis of diverticulitis. Usually the presence of acute diverticulitis is a contraindication to a colonoscopy as the risk of an inadvertent colon perforation can occur. However, in this patient, whether he had cancer, diverticulitis, or ischemic colitis was unclear and the eventual treatment would depend on obtaining an accurate diagnosis. CT scan images again show acute diverticular changes. The thickened bowel wall is readily apparent on the upper left image. The upper right image with the red ellipse reveals an area of thickened, chronically hypertrophied and indurated bowel wall. Diverticular changes, the curved white U-shaped arrow in the lower colon shows again thickened edematous bowel wall with abscess changes seen within the mesentery. The image in the lower left where the red circle is reveals a small diverticular abscess. The right lower image shows a small amount of oral contrast, gastrographin, moving through an area of very narrowed colon consistent with a stricture. Another complication of diverticulosis is bleeding. Here we see three separate images of diverticular bleeding. Often this bleeding is massive and occurs in elderly patients. As we learned earlier, 50% of these bleeds will occur in the right colon. If you click on the top video link provided, you'll learn how diverticular bleeding can be treated using colonoscopic intervention or injection therapy using saline or an epinephrine solution. Remember, diverticulitis does not bleed, but diverticulosis can and does. The reason the blood vessel begins to bleed at the base of the diverticulum is unclear, although it's suspected to result from the friction of a fecal lith contained within the diverticulum. However, there is no feces seen within any of these three images. Likely, like a nosebleed, it is spontaneous. And luckily, also like a nosebleed, most will stop without the need for any surgical intervention. Remember that in order for a bleeding scan to pick up the bleeding area, it must be bleeding in excess of a half a cc blood loss per minute. And geography requires even faster blood loss, about one cc a minute. Another complication of diverticular disease is the formation of a stricture. In this barium or gastrographin contrast radiograph, we see diverticuli in an area of narrowing. Without reviewing the other films in this series performed under fluoroscopy, it's not possible to say whether this is an actual spasm, i.e. peristalsis, or an area of narrowing secondary to chronic diverticulitis and hypertrophy of the muscular walls of the colon. Nevertheless, if the spasm does not open during filling of the colon with the contrast material and continues to stay narrow, we can safely assume that it's a stricture. This can cause a bowel obstruction with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and abdominal distension. The difficulty in using contrast studies of the colon to diagnose a stricture is that it does not completely rule out a narrowing from colon cancer.
that, as you know, can appear as an apple core lesion. Apple core lesions are also basically strictures, secondary to the intraluminal growth of the cancer. In these two images, we can see areas of narrowing circumscribed by the red ellipses. The image on the right demonstrates leakage of contrast out of the colon and back into the colon consistent with a colocolonic fistula and distal to this fistula marked by the black arrows a colonic stricture. The image on the left shows a narrowing in the colon consistent with a stricture but there are also so few diverticuli seen in this colon the clinician must be astute and will need to perform colonoscopic attempts to obtain a biopsy of the area in order to rule out cancer as a cause of the narrowing. Here, a contrast enema shows a few diverticuli in the sigmoid colon, but an area of severe narrowing is noted. Depending on the patient's symptoms, urgent surgery, or even an elective planned operation, may be needed to remove this stricture and this site of obstruction. Should an urgent operation be needed, the result of the large bowel obstruction from the underlying stricture, the patient may require a colostomy. If you'd like an introduction to barium enema examinations and how to interpret them, click on the provided link. The details will also be presented later by your radiology faculty at another time. What is a fistula? It's an abnormal connection between two epithelialized surfaces. Examples, a belly button ring and a pierced ear are two good, readily visible and available examples. The most common fistula is between the sigmoid colon and the bladder. The patient presenting with pneumaturia, urinating air, or urinating feces, fecal urea, and sometimes with suprapubic pain. In the image on the upper left, a graphic is shown demonstrating a colovescal fistula. The middle image shows contrast leaking from the sigmoid colon and filling the bladder, the red ellipse consistent with the diagnosis of a colovescal fistula. The image in the upper right shows air in the bladder, consistent with a colovescal fistula. Of course, the image in the lower right shows a bladder grossly filled with contrast, consistent with a large colovescal fistula. All of these require operative intervention, usually a colon resection and repair of the bladder. Further, the cause of diverticulosis once believed to be caused by increased pressure from constipation or eating a low residue diet may now actually be linked to alcohol and fiber supplements once the mainstay of treatment. These may contribute to worsening of the disease. Other treatments such as Miralax may replace the fiber supplements in helping patients maintain bowel regularity without increasing the complications of diverticular disease. Some patients have developed fiber cast of their entire colon because of lack of patient mobility, nonstop unchecked usage of fiber supplements without adding proper hydration or without increasing or improving bowel movement frequency. Continuance of colon screening via colonoscopy is encouraged for all patients over 50 or in those with a family history of colon cancer. Age of first degree relative diagnosed with colon cancer, subtract 10 years. For example, if your father was diagnosed with colon cancer at age 45, you would expect to receive your first colon screening exam at age 35. So when must surgical intervention for chronic, recurrent, uncomplicated diverticulitis be considered? This depends on the patient's lifestyle, the availability of other healthcare services, such as interventional radiology, and of course, the clinical examination of the patient, the overall health and age of the patient, and two or three or more documented episodes that require antibiotics, result in loss of work, persistent pain, or recurrent symptoms should direct the physician to the proper treatment. Note that in some cases, two episodes of diverticulitis may require surgical intervention, especially if it's a young patient in their 20s or 30s, as recurrent diverticulitis in a young patient is more likely and should be treated more aggressively because the risk of recurrence and complications over time is so much higher. However, each patient decision is made on an individualized basis. So in summary, we've learned diverticuli can occur anywhere throughout the GI tract. 
They can be false or pseudo diverticuli or form congenitally as true diverticuli. Patients with symptomatic diverticular disease present commonly with pain in the left lower quadrant. Bleeding is a symptom of diverticulosis and not of diverticulitis. We know diets containing peanuts, popcorn seeds, etc. do not cause or exacerbate diverticulitis by getting stuck in the diverticulum. We've learned that complications of colonic diverticuli include abscess and infection, perforation, bleeding, stricture, and fistula formation. Ischemic colitis is exactly what the name implies. It is an area of colon, usually in the splenic flexure, that isn't getting the proper blood supply. This causes pain, cramping, bleeding, fever, diarrhea, and sometimes an elevated white count. Why the splenic flexure? Well, it's because it's one of two watershed areas of the colon. That is where the blood supply is comprised of two larger supplies of blood vessels, in this case, where the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery meet, conjoining by the smaller vessels forming the marginal artery of Drummond. Note too, in the top image, there's a second watershed area of the colon, the distal rectosigmoid. In this area of the colon, the superior rectal arteries join with the distal sigmoid arteries. Interestingly, this area too can be affected by ischemic changes. But why is there compromised blood supply? Smoking causes atherosclerotic disease which causes plaque to form in the artery walls, causing a decrease in blood flow to the area. It's also a well-known complication of abdominal aortic aneurysm repairs, that the rectosigmoid can become ischemic. Whenever a patient had an open AAA repair, and on post two, day two or three, the rectosigmoid becomes ischemic, causing bloody bowel movements. Is there a treatment? Well, honestly, it's a nightmare scenario. Sometimes watchful waiting works, and sometimes the rectosigmoid junction actually dies and the patient needs a sigmoid resection, which is not a good thing to do on top of a freshly placed Gore-Tex or Dacron mesh. Of course, hypercoagulable states, vasculitis, and some medications can also result in ischemic changes. I'm not sure how prolonged strenuous exercise causes ischemic colitis. I gotta look that one up. The diagnosis is usually made clinically and then confirmed with a colonoscopic exam, with or without biopsies. A CT scan, usually done in the emergency room, will show thickened mucosa near the splenic flexure, or maybe even pneumatosis, which is air within the bowel wall. The colonoscopy exam shows white hardened plaques, erosions with raw mucosa, with a usually demarcated line of normal colon meeting ischemic colon, in this figure, the arrows show the normal colon abutting the ischemic area. Angiography isn't usually necessary because it doesn't bleed that rapidly, but that's the usual case, never say never. Of course, there are other causes of bright red blood per rectum. Infections such as Clostridium difficile, Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and enteropathogenic E. coli. And of note, C. diff does not usually result in blood, it usually results in just a really foul-smelling diarrhea with abdominal pain. The treatment for ischemic colitis is usually bowel rest, transfusion if the blood counts are low enough, sometimes heparin and sometimes antibiotics, but heparin and antibiotics are controversial. Stopping smoking can help drop the nicotine level and maybe decrease the amount of atherosclerotic changes. Long-term ischemia can result in hardened scar tissues of the colon, causing a narrowed area called a stricture. And if perforation occurs, a colon resection is mandated. If a stricture occurs secondary to the ischemic changes and obstruction of the flow of feces occurs, a resection would be needed too. Usually this is a disease of elderly smokers, but be open to other causes of bleeding too. Thank you for your attention during the presentation regarding diverticular disease and its complications and a brief intro of ischemic colitis. If you have any questions, please reach out to me via email. I will put together a transcript of the presentation and a few practice test questions. I'll send the transcript and exam files as PDF files.